Thank you. So um, before I start my spiel, I would love to ask a few questions just to break the ice. So when was the last time uh, you got up at 2 o'clock to go to work? All right, none of you. When was the last time you got scouted because you're late for work? I don't think it exists in Google, right? <laughs> <laughs> then when was the last time you worked through Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year Eve, New Year Day? None of you. And when was the last time you drove over eight hours? How did that feel? It sucks, <laughs> right. And have you tried parking at an emergency zone before? All right. We have all the law-abiding citizens here. And when was the last time you drove through snow and wind? I did it once. When was that? Yeah, I, I remember when I went to Vegas, I drove through the wind and it was, I thought I would die and I would never want it to do it again. But unfortunately, all of above, which we don't have experience with most of the time, is our truck driver's life. My name is Lydia Yen, CEO and co-founder of Next Trucking. We call ourselves the first trucker-centric marketplace where we connect shippers with small trucking companies, owner, operator, or small fleets. Um, we are actually a platform that connect the carriers with their preferred loads according to their own availabilities, though the drivers can drive their preferred loads. And we started a company in October 2015, three years old, grew the revenue 100% year over year. And uh, this year we're looking at uh, 3x our revenue. Um, we are a venture-backed company by uh, venture firms including Sequoia Capital, Brookfield, and it will raise a total of uh, $25 million as of today. So a lot of people thought trucking is just the moving goods, but actually trucking is a huge industry, and 70% of freight in the U.S. is actually moved on the trucks. And the trucking industry has five large segments, four truckload, less than a truckload. Drayage is moving the container from the port to a local warehouse. And Intermodal is putting the container on the rail in a small parcel. So we focus on two segments. One is pulling the container from the port to a local warehouse. And the second is moving the goods from the local warehouse to distribution centers like Amazon, Walmart, Target, etc. The industry is huge but extremely fragmented. 90% um, of the trucking companies are small ones. Most of them have less than six trucks. Top 50 trucking companies only accounts for 16% of the market share. The largest trucking company only owns 12,000 trucks and is a $9 billion public company. We have two huge problems in the industry. One is lack of transparency, no technology. It's an antiquated industry. Drivers rely on brokers to find them loads via phone calls, text messages, emails, sometimes even fax. It's ridiculous, I know that. And uh, a lot of back and forth negotiations. Drivers want certain loads, they're human beings. And the uh, shipper wants certain lanes to be covered. And they wanted to come to an agreement. It's, very, it's a lot, it involves a lot of phone calls. So the second is our industry's number one problem is trucker shortage. Our industry's lack of at least 100,000 truck drivers. Turnover rate, 97%, which means Every single trucking company needs to change their whole fleet once a year. Nobody wants to be a truck driver. It's a tough lifestyle. I mentioned all the bullet points before that you don't want that. And the, the turnover, that creates a turnover rate. And also, drivers don't get paid that well. Average truck driver make about $45,000 a year. Super tough lifestyle. And uh, another thing that really cost the churn in the truck drivers is really what we call force dispatching. I live in LA, I took a load to Arizona, I wanted to go home. I call all my brokers looking for a backhaul. People give me either loads to New York or somewhere else. Nobody can bring me home. So as a truck driver, I only have two options, 
One, I bobtail home, basically I haul an empty trailer, I'll lose money, or I go to another state. I might need to celebrate my daughter's birthday, but too bad, I cannot find a, a backhaul. So that's how we created Next Trucking, the first trucker-centric marketplace, where we design a solution really for truck drivers, and we allow them to connect with shippers. For the shipper site, we allow shippers to access to a large, massive database of virtual fleet in Southern California. We're actually different from a lot of tech startups that are trying to spread the world. What we're trying to do is really, we call building the lanes. It's a marketplace. You wanted to make sure your supply meets demand. And it's a very fragmented market. So what we did is we started with Southern California. We built a lot of local capacities and we built lanes, which means we bring trucks from Southern California to Northern California to Arizona, Texas, Nevada. So those are the cool lanes we built. And also we allow shippers to track and trace the drivers real time. Google Map is so advanced, but too bad. Shippers never know where the driver is. Even till today, shippers call broker, broker call trucker, and ask for the trucker's location, then communicate back to the shipper. Tons of back and forth negotiations and the communication. Sometimes drivers may lie, brokers may lie, right? So there's really no transparency in it. And also we provide our shippers real time proof of delivery. It's a little bit piece of paper with driver's signature and received a signature on it proving that the load is delivered. But in the past or even today, brokers need to call a driver, driver bring that piece of paper back to the broker's office, getting the payment, and the broker scan that piece of paper and send to a shipper. Then they will collect the money. Shipper will collect money from the buyers. But the whole process takes two to four weeks which means as a shipper, my merchandise got delivered. I cannot even bill my buyer after four weeks. Huge cash flow issues for a lot of shippers. So without solution, every, everything is online, everything is digitalized. So shipper can bill the buyers the moment the loads get delivered. And of course, we provide EDI and API solution. Of course, a lot. I remember when I was pitching Sequoia Capital, I said, like, we're EDI and API ready. They were like, what is EDI? I remember one of the senior partners said, oh, that was technology from 20 years ago. We actually invested in one of those companies. But too bad, we still use this in trucking industry today. So from the carrier side, we provide predictive load offering capabilities. So basically, we study driver's behavior, their own preferences, their availabilities, so we can predict the kind of loads that we wanted to give to the shippers. So they don't need to call, they don't need to negotiate. Whatever we give to them, they will accept. So actually, we reduce the time that they spend on negotiating with traditional brokers. On top of that, we provide field events, quick pay, and offer a very lightweight web-based fleet management software. And of course, on top of that, we have walkie-talkies on the app. They can communicate with other drivers, really trying to create a community feeling for our drivers. And different from other tech startups, as I mentioned, we're port-focused. We're regional-focused. LA is the largest port of the whole country. 40% of our merchandise in this country are imported, and 30% of them come into LA and Long Beach port. LA represents 15, I'm sorry, this year 17 TEUs. So TEU is 20 equivalent unit. So it's really a matrix we measure how many containers are coming in. So average container is about 40 footer, so 20 is like half of containers. So we're looking at about 8.5 million containers coming into this port. And the LA is alone is $14 billion shipping business. So we don't need to even go out to build a multi-billion dollar company here. We created this really program last year. It's, we call it a different kind of drayage. So I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but with this solution, it's actually a combination of our virtual fleet, asset, and marketplace, and allow us to inject additional capacity to drayage and increase the turns of trucks in the terminals so for our drage relay drivers, they on average make 20% more money. Not necessarily pay them more, but they are more efficient because right now 40% of the capacity is wasted. And our goal and ambition is really to go to every single port in the US 
and they really give the best solution to the port to reduce the congestion at the terminals, to bring in freight more f a lot faster, and to make sure the merchandise moves a lot faster, shippers will increase the cash flow. And uh, why we do this and do what we do? So a lot of people wanted to start up a company because they see the problems, but a lot of them start a company because they saw the buzzword, like blockchain, right? like um, AI, people just want to apply technology on something, but we are doing this is really for a cause. So this is a real story. Um, Kevin Luke is one of our own operators. I wanted to give you a little bit of background of him. He had a little small business a couple years ago. It's a tax business and he failed miserably and he actually filed a bankruptcy. He and his wife live on the street. So he worked for a trucking company, going to the terminal every single day. He really worked hard to save up. So the moment he saved up a, a little money to be able to pay for the down payment for a truck, he bought his first truck. He wanted to be an entrepreneur, so he became owner operator. He went to the terminal every single day. He worked so many hours a day, but still he could barely survive. He found us last year. And uh, the reason why we found about this story is he came to our office for the mobile 2.0 focus group. And uh, he shared his personal story and he broke down during the um, focus group. I wanted to share this video with you. Uh, I got into trucking. Uh, my grandfather was dying from cancer and he kind of passed a torch to me. When I was homeless, it was the toughest thing I ever could have been through. I was actually sleeping in uh, a guy's truck I was driving, and me and my wife. So she used to have to wait till I got off 18 hours to get in the bed. But you push through something like that, you, what, what can stop you? Working for Next uh, changed my life dramatically as uh, far as giving me a lot of time back to spend with the family, uh, doubled my income, uh, allowing me to grow my business to another level uh, faster than what I expected. So, um, so I always told my team, because of stories like this, it's emotional, it's beautiful. And we're not just building a mobile app, we're changing people's life. It's bigger than what we thought it is. And also this kept us going and it kept us moving forward because we're literally changing truck drivers' life. And a lot of people ask me, Lydia, why now? Why didn't you come up with this solution 10 years ago? Trucking never changed in the past the centuries. True, trucking never changed. It was like that in the past 24 years. But logistics was not that important 10 years ago. I remember 10 years ago, because my husband has been in logistics for a long time, and I was actually talking to some investors who wanted to raise some money for his small logistics company. Nobody wanted to talk to us 10 years ago, because logistics was not sexy enough. It's not tech enough. It's not cool enough. But 10 years ago, international trading companies had thick margins. So logistic cost is really a fraction of their margin. But with the growth of e-commerce and the transparency of the world, now it becomes very, very transparent. So vendors, the margin actually decreased dramatically, while logistics cost increased dramatically. Right now, logistic cost accounts for 10% of an average vendor's margin. So it become very, very important. So now all of a sudden, everyone's looking into logistics to see how we can be more efficient, how we can save money there. That's why in the past three years, millions of dollars got poured into logistics space. And according to some news, it estimates that US companies is going to spend more than $2.5 billion in disruptive logistics and supply chain technology by 2022. And the overall supply chain logistics tax spending will rise to $87 billion. So everyone's trying to create a solution to make the freight shipping painless. And also there's a fundamental issue with the industry is 
there's a balance between supply and demand, right? We have a lot of freight to move. I know how many of you purchase on Amazon every single month, right? But nowadays, but we don't have enough truck drivers. Our truck drivers are not efficient enough, but they are the fund foundation of our economy. So the goal is really to attract capacity back to the in industry. Our average truck driver's age is over 50. So after 10 years, what do we do? Do we have enough trucks? How can we move the goods? So that's the problem that companies like us, Uber Freight, Convoy, everyone's trying to resolve the problem from different angles. So people talk about future. What are we seeing in the future? We believe companies like us will replace the traditional brokerage technology platform to really connect the shipper with carriers more efficiently. And other than that, we're looking at two players really in the trucking space. One is clean trucks, because carbon emission is re really big problems, in the, especially for the drayage companies, and all the ports really require clean trucks. So clean trucking companies like Tesla, Thor, BYD in China, and also hydrogen companies like Nikola, there will be playing major roles in local drayage. Autonomous is really getting big, and uh, who have uh, a Tesla here? All right. <laughs> who knows way more? <laughs> yes. So this is really the future. And uh, companies like startups like Too Simple, Starsky, Embark, and Google's Waymo, Baidu, Paka, everyone's really looking to autonomous trucks because driving is really a pain for experience for truck drivers, especially for long-haul drivers. Traditional truck manufacturers like Volvo, Toyota, BMW, Volkswagen, I know Mercedes have the most expensive autonomous trucks. Ford, everyone is looking into the space. So this is what we think that will happen in five years. Not 10 years, five years. So for local trucks, we will see a lot of electronic or uh, hydrogen trucks to really create low emission um, transportation methods. So it's really from the local warehouse to a yard. Then from the yard, then to out of state warehouse, it will go on an autonomous truck because it can really eliminate the burden for the drivers driving long hours and allow drivers to really only manage exceptions. Then when the loads arrive at the local city, which is uh, the destination, we will have another local truck that pick up the loads from the yard, then move to local warehouse. I predict it will happen in five years and it might be shorter than we expect. All right, um, so my name is Lydia, and um, I was born in Shanghai, China, so I'm a pure immigrant. I was the only child, um, same as the most of the people that were born over after 1978. Um, so I do have some single child uh, symptoms, um, very selfish. <laughs> but the best thing is I was really the center of the universe in my family and got the best education because education is very important to Chinese families. I went to a school called Shanghai Foreign Language School where I met, I met my first American teacher who actually inspired me to come to this country to pursue my master's degree because I love the freedom that she brought to us. I, she, she brought the best of classes. So after graduating from college in China, I applied for a master's degree um, in the US. I applied for several universities and uh, got accepted by most of them. I chose to go to UVA because of the ranking. I really have no idea what the map looks like. So, um, and also UVA actually gave me a teaching assistant scholarship. Back then, it was very hard for a Chinese citizen to come to this country to study, especially when you don't have scholarship. So I have to get scholarship. So I applied for Italian literature. <laughs> I did study Italian, and, and I got an Italian literature um, teaching assistant scholarship, which means I had to teach 80 students Italian, which is pretty weird for Chinese to teaching Americans Italian. <laughs> but it happened to me. <laughs> but I really appreciated my two semesters at UVA because I actually left after two semesters because I know that I wouldn't want it to be a professor as a career. 
but I really got experience as a coaching. I really got my coaching skills there. And I was not afraid of standing on, on the stage and speak to the people because I got 80 students down there and asked me questions all the time. And I was less nervous, a lot more brave, and I dared to raise my hand and ask questions. I really appreciate that. That's what I learned from UVA. And after then, I transferred to USC, pursued my um, master's degree in communications management because I wanted to be a journalist. But obviously, it was very hard, and my English wasn't even good <laughs> enough back then. Even if nowadays, it's not the best English. Then um, after graduation, obviously, I couldn't find a job as a journalist. So um, I found a job at the, an ad agency as an account executive. So my job was really talk to the show, um, a lot of uh, clients and negotiate contract. I actually practiced my negotiation skills for my first job back then. And uh, who, who's, who's not good at negotiations here? All right, if you're not very good at it, I recommend a book. It's called Never Split the Difference by Chris Moss. He was actually a former FPI um, negotiator for hostage. <laughs> and I, this book was actually introduced by my uh, Sequoia partner, Omar Hamoy. Um, he was the founder of AdMob. He gave me the book, then I read it, I was inspired, and he regretted because I negotiated with him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you have an interest, you can read this. It's, it's actually a very interesting book, and that's available on Amazon and audio as well. <laughs> and after that, I started, because I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I started a few small companies. I failed all of them and failed them miserably. The one memorable one was the one I started in China called Nailuxi. It's a flash sale website, very similar to Guild, because I was really inspired by the Guild. Guild was really big back then. So I went there really bravely, and I brought the, borrowed the money from my family, started this little company with five people, and my margin was 75%. I was selling US merchandises. I was the first one who brought Juicy Couture back to China. And uh, the company was profitable after six months. I was so happy, but I forgot one thing. China is competitive. After a few months, hundreds of flash sale websites came up. Everybody raised tons of money. Nobody wanted to make any money. I got squeezed out. Just six months later, I got flushed out. <laughs> so lesson learned there is two things. Speed is the only competitive advantage. No matter how good your technology is, you need to move fast. No matter how good your team is, you need to move fast. Second, you need to learn, if you wanted to be in tech, you need to make sure your company has money. Fundraising is probably a virtual for a founder. So learning how to raise money is important. So here comes the origin and inspirations from Next Trucking. It's really from two stories I had. Because in my background, I wanted to be a journalist, right? I never was interested in logistics, so unsexy. It's like old men and big guys and like 180 pounds or 200 pounds. So it's very boring to me, but my husband has been in logistics for 15 years. So the other day I went to his office. He actually complained every single day. He's like, I hate logistics. He's like, why are you still in it? But I hate it. So I went to his office. It was chaotic. Everyone's fighting, the, dra the drivers were fighting, the dispatchers were fighting. I remember I sat next to a dispatcher. He spent two hours trying to cover one load. He picked up the phone, called five drivers, trying to find the cheapest one. He found the cheapest one. He gave load to him. And he, he thought, I, I probably can find another cheaper one. So he called two more. Unfortunately, he couldn't find a cheaper one. Went back to the other one, and the driver dropped the load. So he has to do all over again the spiel and trying to lock another driver. Two hours for load, one load. Extremely inefficient. I found it pretty amazing. And the second story is uh, we were actually driving on the freeway the other night after party, uh, me and my husband. So that was midnight. So we saw a big rig parking in an emergency zone. So I was like, I asked my husband, I was like, is he broken down? Like, why is he parking there? He's gonna get a ticket. So my husband was like, he probably doesn't want to pay $25 truck stop parking fee. I was shocked. 
Those guys work day and night. They make so little, and they have to risk their life by parking in an emergency zone trying to save 25 bucks. So that really inspired me. I wanted to do something for them because I see those guys almost every single day. They work hard. They're humble people. They're probably not the most sophisticated people, but they deserve more. So that's where we come up with the inspirations, just to help them. Then we started to understand market and trying to identify where the root cause is. So here comes the ideation. That's how my process was, just for your in reference. I interviewed 100 truck drivers before I came up with this idea. And uh, I understood their pinpoint. They shared their ideas with me. I built my first MVP in three months, and it didn't work. I, when we launched the app in October 2015, I remember we had 30 users. And our idea was like, OK, drive, why don't we write us driver to dictate what they want so they can post their truck? So we actually created this post the truck function on the app. But too bad. Nobody posts the truck. Everyone downloaded the app asking for loads. Because their behavior is, what do you have? Let me choose. So we immediately changed the idea. We switched the gear and say, OK, why don't we do this? Let's post the loads and let them pick. And also, we need to be really regional focused. Why? Because it's such a huge market. If I onboard drivers in New York, I don't have any loads for them, they're going to churn. If I onboard shippers who want to ship on the lanes, I don't have drivers, my shipper will churn. So then we actually scale down to really building lanes, Southern California only. Let's onboard Southern California home-based drivers. Their behavior is very simple. Either I'm local, I go out, I come back. So when we pitch shippers, we do the exact same thing. We're very good with those lanes. We have a lot of drivers. Give those to us. That's how we really create the matching and they really kept the marketplace going. So that's how we evolved. Tested the idea, learn from our customers. So a lot of people ask me, like, Lydia, your background is pretty weak. I was like, of course, look at this. It's the worst package for a startup founder, right? I'm an immigrant. I'm a woman in trucking. And I didn't graduate from Google. I didn't go to Stanford. So I'm pretty, it's like I call it beautifully irrelevant to Silicon Valley. Um, so it actually took me four months to raise my Series A because nobody believed me in me. Like a lot of VCs ask me, Lydia, do you drive a truck? I was like, too bad. I'm too short for that. Um, but that's how I started, and uh, I think there's something in me that kept me going, and I wanted to share it with you if you decide to be a founder one day. It's some strengths that I have. If you're an average founder like me, of course, you're all graduate from, you're all from Google, so you do have the one element that Silicon Valley is looking for. So um, one trait I think I'm really good at is I do have self-awareness. I know my weaknesses. I know what I'm not good at. So that's why I wanted to surround myself with the people who have the qualities I don't have. So I know I'm not a coder, and I'm not a good people manager, and I'm probably not good at communicating ideas. So I actually really surrounded myself and brought in the team who are good in those areas, who can deliver the message better for me, who can really build those an awesome product. And of course, I sell all the time. Not only to my customers, I sell to the employees as well. And I'm very scrappy. At the very beginning, we work on folding tables. I don't know, I, I, people always talk about garage. We're even worse. We don't even have a garage, we have folding tables. Um, I remember one employee, actually, one of my early employees came in. He actually worked on the folding table the first day, and the second day we actually took it away because uh, we have one more person, so he actually he, he worked on his laps. <laughs> so um, we were very scrappy, but we shared one vision. We really wanted to change the truck driver's life fundamentally. So it's important to bring the people that share the vision, who share the mentality, who are equally scrappy as you at the very beginning. And be patient. I was very patient. We made a lot of mistakes, but I never gave up. Even when at the very difficult time in, I think it's the end of 2016, when I was reading Series A, we did $11 million first year. 
for a text topic, it's huge already. I think we did a great job. I was very confident when I walked out and I went to Silicon Valley um, investors. I got turned down by over 50 investors in literally a few weeks. It was very disappointing to me. And uh, I think after 50 pitches, you actually polish the pitch a little bit better and your skin grew a little bit thicker. So um, I didn't give up because at the end of the day, you probably only need one yes. So at the end of 2016, we closed our Series A with a Chinese investor called China Equity Group, we raised $5 million, very small money. And then we kept growing. Everybody wore multiple hats. We worked tirelessly, uh, extremely hard. Um, I remember during the peak seasons, everyone works over 12 hours a day. And then we got, a tra we got really a lot of attractions from Silicon Valley. We pick Sequoia as our Series B investor, of course the best investor we can ask for. And for Series C, it literally took us 30 days to close a almost $100 million round. We only wanted to raise $50 million, but we end up actually raising $97 million. And we got Brookfield on our book, and uh, they're a fantastic strategic investor. So I think another trait that I have is hustle and ask for help. When I just started a company, I didn't know any VCs. I literally add every single person that I can possibly find on LinkedIn. <laughs> and I ask for introductions from the people that I don't even know. That's how I got my first investor. And then um, I also got all the LA founders contacts. I basically messaged them and say, hey, I wanted to get a coffee with you. And I wanted to know how you really bring up your company, what challenges you have, can you share some experience with me? So I made a, very, a group of good friends and who can share experiences with you. And of course, sell, sell, sell. Sell to the investors, sell to the market, and sell to your employees. And one last thing I wanted to mention is company culture is very important. I know Google has fantastic company cultures, but for first time founders, it's hard to define your company cultures. I didn't even know what it is. Um, I remember I went to a Sequoia base camp and I was on a car with uh, Scott Cook, who is the founder of uh, um, Intuit. So I asked him, I was like, hey, what is your company culture? How did you define it? He gave me one word. He's like, you are your company culture. I was like, How does, what does that mean? He's like, you know, you and your leadership team really define what a company is. So after that, we actually spend a lot of time internally trying to form a culture committee, try to really come up with our mission, vision, and value. And this is our first draft, and we know it's going to evolve. So our mission is empower drivers to work the way they want, when they want. And the vision is painless freight. We wanted to acknowledge that freight shipping is really painful. And we're really not resolving any rocket science issues. We are really trying to make the, their life a little bit better, one step at a time. So five values we have is put the drivers first. It's very simple to a lot of uh, tech companies, basically put your users first and demonstrate hustle, passion to win. I think I'm a very aggressive person, even though I'm pretty small, but I think it carries towards the whole company. Everyone's very aggressive. And we wanted to solve a problem, not symptoms. This is actually something that most of you will see if you have a company, because at the very beginning, everybody was trying to put out fires. We actually last year spent tons of time trying to putting out fires. And we didn't really look into root cause. So this is something that we know we made a mistake and we wanted to change that. Set and follow true north because Especially when you have a business, there are a lot of distractions just for us. You know, we wanted to do drainage, but we got business for logistics, other segments, warehousing, transloading. Those are true revenues. This is real dollars. Do we want to do this business? Do we want to sacrifice it? If you said the true north, you know this is the direction you wanted to go and you do not want to be distracted. So it's important you follow that and to trust that it's in good hands. Um, we default to trust that we bring the best to people and that the people will take the ownership. So my final words, uh, recommendations for first time founder, if you ever plan to be one, just to really summarize what I just repeat, uh, said myself. First is understand market 
and the size, the dynamic, identify the problems. Don't start a company because you think it's fancy or it's sexy and there's a buzzword out there, blockchain, it probably doesn't work right now for trucking. And test the ideas, be brave to share the ideas, it's okay. Nobody can steal it if you can execute very well. Learn from your customers. We put ourselves in Linwood. It's not like the beautiful Venice Beach, it's a Santa Monica, we're in the ghetto. And I remember some investor talked to me and they said, oh, where's your office? Because they are coming to visit us. I was like, oh, we're in the ghetto, just be aware, okay? And they came in and said, Lydia, no joke, you're straight out Compton. So we're literally like north of Compton. Um, but we're close to our users. We're literally next to our truck drivers. So we can talk to them on a daily basis and uh, uh, be scrappy. At the very beginning, un unless you're multimillionaires, you cannot afford to build a large team, the best team. You probably need to be scrappy. You probably wanted to do everything yourself. And uh, be patient and never give up. And it's easy to give up, but you know, you will have the light at the end of the tunnel. It will keep you moving. And it'll work extremely hard. This is no brainer. You just have to when you're a founder. Hustle and ask for help. Don't be shy. It's okay to ask for help. There are a lot of founders like us. And when we started, we didn't know what to do. And, and we always were willing to share experience because we walk the road, we know how difficult it is. And they define company cultures early. That's the mistake that most companies make. I did too. I didn't really know my company cultures. We just push forward, drive the revenues, make the app work, and uh, build internal efficiencies. But we didn't know what our company cultures till this year. Last, as a founder, always be your best salesman. Salesman for your team, salesman for your culture, and salesman for your company vision. Well, thank you so much for your time. Any questions?